to you. Uh, please welcome the Honorable Max Bacos and Maggie Jiang. Maggie, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for pulling off this first ever virtual TCA online conference. And um, welcome everyone to this early morning session. This is day two of our 26th annual conference. We're very honored to have Ambassador Max Bacos to be here with us as our keynote speaker. Um, I'm Maggie Zhang, current board member and former president of TCFA and SVP of Franco China Neil Branch. Before we start, I would like to um, discuss a few housekeeping items. One, um, TCFA is a nonprofit 501c registered nonprofit organization, and we do not have any political affiliation. Two, the opinions are of mine and mine only, not the, not the organizations that I'm associated with. And three, since TCV is a finance, um, organization, finance association, we'll focus our topics, our discussions on economics, finance, business matters, and economic impacts of politics. And four, very importantly, if you have questions, please raise them in the Zoom Q&A chat room, um, and we'll try to get to them. We'll allocate about 10 to 15 minutes, depends on how many questions that we have from the audience. In this one hour of um, agenda, we'll try to cover as many areas of Senate Barker's long tenure career. Um, prior to the call, some of you have sent in questions. Um, we also prepared additional ones. So today, Ambassador and I will discuss these prepared questions and then we'll move on to Q&A. In the next 40 to 45 minutes, um, we'll talk about mainly three topics. One is the pandemic-related economic policies um, on taxation, technology, and environment, and healthcare. And two, um, two would we'll, we'll do a deep dive into the U.S. healthcare reform. And three, as many of you um, are very interested, the U.S.-China relationship post-election China policy. Uh, lastly, we'll ask for a few career advice from Mr. Uh, Balkert, um, and after that Q and A. So, without further ado. Let me introduce um, Ambassador Barker for the debate. Um, Mr. Barker served as United States Senate from Montana for 36 years, and he served as the 11th U.S. Ambassador to China from 2014 to 2017. As chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, uh, Mr. Barker was the chief architect of the Affordable Care Act, which was signed into law in 2009. Um, he has extensive experience in international trade. Uh, in fact, he was deeply involved in facilitating China's entrance into the WTO. He was the chairman of the Joint Committee on Taxation and also served on several committees on agriculture, environment, public health, transportation infrastructure. Before that, um, he was a U.S. House representative. Mr. Bunkers now devotes much of his time to Max Bunkers um, Institute at University of Montana, uh, funded to give young adults opportunities in politics, governance, and overseas studies. So let's uh, move on to our discussion. Welcome, Mr. Bunkers. Um, thank you so much to be here with us. As a fun fact for the audience, uh, Mr. Bunkers actually had run 50 miles ultra marathon, um, quite an achievement. Um, I myself can no longer mile. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, due to the pandemic, um, Mr. Bagas, S&P projected that globally higher insolvency risk, um, even after recovery, uh, global debt to GDP surged to 256 percent. Um, of which government counts 97% of GDP, corporate debt 103% of GDP, and household debt 66% GDP. These are very staggering numbers. So should politicians shy away from debt, um, or this is a necessary evil for the time being? Thank you, Maggie. And thank you all very much for um, um, allowing me to participate in your conference. It's, I looked at the <clears throat> lineup and agenda, you have a lot of very, very bright people speaking. It's going to be an excellent conference. Uh, first, um, let me say that um, we're still very much in the COVID world. 
and COVID is going to drive a lot of decisions made by the United States government in the next oh, year, certainly, and probably um, governments uh, around the world. The, um, it's, it's very different uh, from the 2007-8 financial crisis. Back then, I was on the, um, oh, the committee that essentially worked to reduce the, the, the uh, impact of the financial crisis, and we put a, we put a stimulus package together uh, if I recall correctly, it was under a trillion dollars. It was very, very difficult to put together um, because that was somewhat new uh, to a lot of members of Congress. By new, I mean deficit spending. We've never faced a financial crisis, um, at least not in our lifetimes. We had been there long enough, but it was hard to get members of the Senate, especially, to spend money on, on stimulus. That's deficit spending. People don't like deficit spending. And, but we finally put a package together. I remember working on it so hard that um, even uh, uh, to spend more money for the stimulus to help the, relieve the adverse effects of the financial crisis that uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi banned me from her office for a while because I was so insistent that we have to spend more. We have to help, <coughs> help people who are adversely affected by this financial crisis. Well, anyway, we got that straightened out. This time it's much different. We're now in COVID, um, everybody's rushing to spend money. Um, in fact, most economists say, at least economists that, that the president, about to be president-elect Joe Biden, um, will uh, work for him say that, uh, no, 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 Mr. President, you'd have to spend a lot more money addressing COVID uh, than we did back in the, in the earlier financial crisis. So and that's what's happened. Um, and uh, it's not just the US government, but it's the uh, it's other governments spending a lot of money to help people who have hurt from COVID, but also people who lost their jobs because of COVID with the stay at home orders or lockdowns or whatnot, which caused very high unemployment. So a lot of money is going to be spent to, to address COVID. I might say too that, uh, um, that probably COVID spending will increase the deficit and the debt. Um, I, you, I think you'll find a Biden administration trying to, to live within its means uh, with respect to extra spending, that is infrastructure spending, that is a rollback of the Trump tax cut and uh, use that additional revenue to pay for additional infrastructure. But that all depends in part, frankly, on Georgia. I say Georgia because um, although Joe Biden probably will, will be the president, a Democrat, that the Senate uh, may or may not be a Republican Senate because that depends very much on the Georgia elections on January 5th. There are two runoff elections on January 5th. And um, if, Democrats have to win both to, to flip back to a Democratic majority in the Senate. Republicans need only win one of those two Georgia Senate runoffs on January 5th to keep the Senate. And that's important because the, the political party that's controlled the Senate will very much determine the amount of deficit spending that uh, President Joe Biden will otherwise attempt. Um, that's, that really is the nub of the issue here in, in this lame duck session. That is, people are hurting, and you'll and uh, President elect, even though even uh, Biden, even though he's not president, will want to urge the Congress to spend more to help people who are hurt by COVID. And President Trump, when he was president, and even now as president, will probably want to spend money on COVID. And Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, wants to spend more money. The rub is that uh, a lot of Republican senators are starting to revert back to their usual traditional ways of, of being more worried about deficit spending. And they don't want to spend as much. So that's going to be the really, the, the, as I said, the number of the battle going forward. How, whether Republicans keep deficit money, keep, keep uh, the Congress and the president was spending too much money. Well, meantime, though, 
the Fed clearly is helping matters. The Fed is by keeping interest rates very low. They close to zero is causing a lot more money to, uh, to be injected into the U.S. financial system. That's helping. That's helping address COVID. So far, interest. So far, inflation is not coming up, as we're very lucky in that respect. So the Fed's ad, is injecting money into the system, and you'll find deficit spending to be the, more deficit spending to be the to be a, a, a paramount uh, going forward. This is very different from years past. It's fascinating, frankly. And back well, during the 1986 tax reform bill, um, that's the bill that President Reagan proposed. Um, I was on the finance committee. We had a rule and the rule was uh, <clears throat> no increase in the deficit, none. We're gonna, we're gonna lower taxes, we're gonna lower taxes. And we did significantly, but when we lower taxes, we're gonna have to increase revenue someplace else in the tax code. So it came out to be no deficit spending. And if any member of the Senate wanted to offer amendment to lower taxes for, to help some group, um, that member of the Senate had to also offer a, a corresponding amendment to increase revenue by the same amount. So there, there was no deficit spending. You mentioned the Affordable Care Act. That was a rule in the Affordable Care Act too. The Affordable Care Act, which, uh, which uh, passed Congress roughly 2010, I think it was, um, cost the U.S. Treasury one trillion dollars over ten years. However, that was all made up for other provisions in that bill, so it was deficit neutral. That one trillion dollar tax bill didn't cost one thin dime because it was deficit neutral. That was the mood of members of the of the Congress and the President, President Obama, back then. No deficit spending, no deficit spending, but that's not the case today at all. Well, obviously. Uh, today, it doesn't matter if, um, if we deficit spend, according to, at least not in the short term, according to uh, the, the belief of uh, many in the, in the Congress. Uh, people don't care about deficit spending in America today as much as they, and it, that is the public, as much as they did maybe 10 years ago. It's just, you know, this cry about deficit spending, oh gosh, it's terrible. We gotta live within our means. So people kind of know that in the abstract but they haven't seen any adverse consequences yet. So they kind of don't spend, spend much time thinking about it. It's, 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 it's a difference between like spending and taxation are just totally different. People who receive money love it, but people don't want to pay taxes. So they're not about to want to agree to any tax bill where they got to pay more taxes. And why they have to pay taxes anyway, because there have been no adverse consequences of deficit spending that they've seen. So it's, it's, it's very hard for the deficit hawks these days, they get up ahead of steam. It's very, very hard. And I frankly think that, the, um, that, that, uh, that there'll be about a one to $2 trillion additional stimulus bill. I'm not sure if it, if it passes the lame duck session, it'd be lower. If it passes uh, January, February next year, it'd be greater, but uh, it's, there'll, there'll be COVID spending. Now I mentioned infrastructure. You'll see a lot there, a lot there. Um, both political parties realize, and Americans realize it. We, we in America have not invested in our infrastructure like we should. Some Americans have been to China. They see you know high speed trains, they see railroad stations, the train stations, airports, and 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 you know and travel on the trains and think come back to America. It's oh my gosh, we're a third world country. Uh, we're just, we're terrible. Uh, but not enough people have gone to China to see that. Uh, if more people were to see those trains, high speed trains in China, you'd find politically more uh, effort in the United States to, to address infrastructure. Now, Joe Biden, um, I think he will be president. His campaign primarily as a unifier. He wants to bring people together. Um, and he's going to, initially governed the same way. By that, I mean, he's not going to offer um, hot button um, proposals or issues that are divisive in America. Rather, he's gonna to try to find proposals that where, there's, where there tends to be bipartisan agreement. And what are they? Well, infrastructure is one. Infrastructure is a big one. The country knows, both political parties know that 
much more should be spent on uh, repairing America's roads, its highways, bridges, but also the new technologies, uh, especially new technologies, uh, AI, big data, uh, nanotechnology, uh, you know, machine learning, et cetera. It's all because they, they see China, China 2025, and that's kind of uh, stirs the competitive juices in Americans and certainly among American politicians. So you'll see a lot of inf inf new spending in the US on, a, on those items as well. More R&D, some subsidies for those industries. It's a bit difficult in the US because we're not a, a, a controlled economy. We're not authoritarian economy, like say China, where China could give directions and spending in different provinces and cities and mayors can take their cues and borrow more money and spend more on those projects. We, can, we don't do that in the US. Um, it's, it's complicated, which may slow things down a little bit. Um, and it's the, the real question in the United States is, okay, where are we gonna find the money for, for infrastructure? And the two real possible sources, one is roll back the tax cuts that the President Trump enacted, and the other is um, public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships kind of roll off the, the tongue in America, but nobody knows really what they mean. It's just very, it, once, once you get down the details, uh, then things kind of slow down. And that, that too is going to be, be an issue. But back on the tax cut, um, that too is going to very much depend on, on, on the Georgia elections, January 5th. If um, it turns out that it's a, it's a, a Democratic Senate, then it's quite clear that those Trump tax cuts, which will, uh, will be largely rescinded, which means corporate rates go back up and, and rates on the most wealthy individuals go back up. But on the other hand, if it's a Republican Senate in January after the Georgia elections, then you'll see it's very difficult for President Biden to roll back the Trump tax cuts. Very difficult, almost impossible. Uh, tax legislation is extremely complicated, extremely complicated. And in my judgment, no real significant tax le legislation passes unless it has the backing of the president. Back in 86, that was Ronald Reagan. He really wanted uh, tax reform and he got it. Um, a couple, three years ago, Trump really wanted tax reform and he got it. Um, but if a president doesn't want tax reform or, or is not, doesn't want to invest a lot of his capital in tax reform or lower taxes or to raise taxes, in this case, it's very, very hard. And I was chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. I joined with a, a, guy, named, a guy named Dave Camp, who is a chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican. We worked really close together for a major tax reform bill. Oh, well, that must have been about 2011, 12, and to there. And we went around the country. We had a, a good outline of, of a bill. Uh, but then we realized we're, it wasn't going anywhere. Why? Because President Obama didn't care. Um, if we didn't have the, <laughs> the full faith and credit, if we didn't have President Obama's <clears throat> involvement, we knew it was dead. It's going nowhere. Major tax reform does not occur in the United States unless there's the, People just, it's upswelling of demand by the people, or if, if the president really wants it. And if the, you don't see people clamoring for tax reform. Um, so it's up to the president. If the president doesn't want it, um, he doesn't want to invest the capital, it won't be much. And it'd be hard for President Biden to push tax reform if he ends up with Republican Senate. So that's kind of where it stands. That's great. Well, thanks. And back to Margaret, um, Robert. It's great that you have rolled, you know, over the 10 questions that I already have. Um, so about the taxation, right? Um, at this point, the in 2020's U.S. federal budget, the tax structure roughly um, is in this way. 49% coming from income tax, 35% come from payroll tax, 7%, only 7% from corporate tax, which was lower from 9% due to the Trump tax cut. So is this type of tax structure um, sustainable? And um, after the election, if Biden uh, becomes the president, how will he change the tax structure 
um, and who's going to pay more taxes fundamentally? I think that's where the tension is. Yeah, well, uh, uh, that breakout probably will continue. Um, over time, corporations pay a lower percentage of total U.S. tax, basically uh, because they lobby pretty effectively um, in, in the Congress. They're able to kind of get their taxes down a bit. And add to that, you know, the bigger the company, the more the company is able to, to manage its, um, its, uh, the tax code in a way to lower taxes. So the effective rate of companies is, is quite a bit lower than the, than the nominal rate. Um, and that's also true for individual taxes. That is the wealthier you are, the more the effective rate is a little bit lower than the, than, than the nominal rate. Um, payroll tax is high because we're very concerned about social security and Medicare. Payroll tax, as you know, pays for retirement in America. and also pays for, for, for Medicare in, in America. Uh, at seniors, and that pays for Medicaid in America, which is lower income Americans. It also pays for something called a, a children's health insurance. Um, so, um, and as, as seniors, as, as Americans demographically becomes a more aging society, more dollars are gonna be needed to pay for social security. So the payroll tax is gonna, gonna stay high. I don't see that the, the pay, payroll tax will not be lowered in the United States. It may be bumped up slightly even to take care of, of seniors who retire not this year, but people retire as seniors, not this year, but maybe 15, 20 years from now. Um, so in answer to your question, it, um, if Biden's president, and if it's a Democratic Senate, then the corporate rates will roll back to, to, to close to where they were, I guess, before the Trump tax cut. And, and people, and Biden keeps saying, people, people with incomes above 400,000 will find some increase in taxes, but those below will, will not. So it's wealthier Americans will pay more taxes if Biden's president, if it's a Democratic Senate. Um, and the corporations will pay some more. Will it, how, how much will that affect a, a, a company or business, an individual? That of course depends upon the, the industry, it depends upon um, uh, how well that, that, that company is doing. My judgment is it's, it's not going to be catastrophic uh, to wealthy Americans or to, um, uh, to individuals. But go back, it's very hard to lower taxes. Excuse me, it's very hard for a president uh, to increase taxes. Very hard. So I, I, I frankly doubt, that, uh, especially if it's a Republican Senate, I doubt that you're going to see the Biden tax, proposed tax increases, corporate and individual, are going to affect, or if they do, it'll be, it'll be modest. It will not be nearly as much as Biden proposes. And even, and even if it's a Democratic Senate, um, I, I suspect that the, the tax cuts, the Trump tax cuts, will not be reinstated to the degree that uh, Biden talks about. It just, there's just too much resistance to increase taxes. I see. Great point. Um, so, what about the healthcare reform? Because, you know, as you mentioned, Medicare and Medicaid um, actually is, consumes a big part of our federal budget or revenue. Um, and we also know that compared with OECD countries, on average, um, US spends about almost twice as much um, in terms of healthcare. However, um, the vast expectancy of the U.S. is actually lower than some of the OECD countries. What is the root cause for this um, healthcare, healthcare system issues in the U.S.? And then what is your view uh, in terms of how to reform the healthcare? Would, would there be public options, single-payer options, or other options that we have? Um, U.S. has been going through the, the healthcare reform since 1965 through different president and different um, regulations and reforms. So can you give us your views on the healthcare reform and where it's going to go? Yeah, this is a big uh, problem. Healthcare spending is a big problem in America. We Americans spend about, oh, two to three times more per capita than the next most expensive country. And why is that? I think there's several reasons. Uh, uh, number one, we're, we're not um, a, 
a, a universal coverage system like other countries. We don't, we're not a single payer uh, uh, system like other countries. Don't have public options. Maybe to some degree, like other companies. Rather, in America, um, the various healthcare providers, doctors, you know, insurance companies, medical device manufacturers, everybody kind of get, does their own thing. Uh, they, you know, doctors do a good job, take care of patients, and then they charge patients. Uh, hospitals do the same, charge patients. It's kind of a, it's a really a free for all in America, and it's not organized. And when we passed the Affordable Care Act back in 2010, we try to get uh, the health system a little more organized and try to cut back some of those excessive costs. Uh, frankly, there were many, there were tens of millions of Americans who were uninsured, had no health insurance uh, back then. Today, we were able to add about, cut that down by about 10 or 20 million dollars, 10 or 20 million people, so that we, there's a lot more coverage today. What's the cause of the increased cost in America? There's several things. One is a is a <clears throat> doctors are compensated essentially according to the number of services they provide. Um, the more the services, the more the income of the doc. Well, the big incentive is to keep providing more services, whether it's needed or not. In, in some cases, add to that, <clears throat> it's a, we have a, a reimbursement system which is extremely complicated. That is, um, you know person has private health insurance, or maybe it's Medicare, or maybe it's Medicaid. And if it's private health insurance, there are 19 different kinds of health insurance policies. So the administrative costs in America are very, very high. Administrative costs amount to about 15, 20% of, um, uh, of American healthcare costs. They're very high. And in single pay countries, administrative costs are virtually zero. They're, they're very, very low. Um, Let's take Canada. In Canada, if you are, if you're ill, you walk into a hospital, and the Canadian, the Canada says, "Okay, are you a Canadian resident?" You don't even have to be a Canadian citizen. If you're a Canadian resident, you show them that. And if it's not emergency care, okay. Um, if it's emergency care, okay, we'll take care of it right now. If it's not emergency care, uh, maybe you have to get in line. In America, um, there you have is a whole large room of people doing claims processing, of trying to figure out what your health insurance is. Back over in Canada, it's one room, and about two or three people. So American claims processing is extremely expensive because of all the health insurance companies, and Medicare and Medicaid. And during, as you know, during the presidential primary debate here in America. Big debate, should the United States be single pay or not? Um, public option or not? And uh, Joe Biden was kind of lo the lonely man in the room. He kept saying, no, no, no single pay, no, no public option, but rather let's keep the current system as we have and build upon it. He wanted to keep the current system as it is because with a single pay, a lot of people be thrown out of work, a lot of, People who work for private insurance companies be thrown out of work or claims process out of work. So he's trying to thread the needle, frankly, uh, by cutting down costs, but not throwing people out of work by saying, okay, let's consider a public option. When I was drafting the Affordable Care Act, um, my basic rule was everything's on the table. We'll consider all options, but for single pay. My, view, my, my judgment was the United States was not ready for a single payer system. It's just too radical. For the United States, it may cut costs, uh, may look good theoretically, but uh, as you try to implement it, it's just going to cause too much chaos and never get passed in the Congress anyway. So now Joe is talking about a public option. So you keep the private, you have know, public option. My personal view is it's going to be very, very, very hard to get a public option option passed. Very hard. Well, I'll predict it will not be passed um, in, the next, in the next couple of years because if you have a public alongside a private. Then it really gets complicated. Um, you have different reimbursement rates. You have a public. What are, what are the terms of the public option? You know what's covered, what's not covered. That's a big debate. It's just going to get all bollock stuff. So we're probably we'll just try to improve the current system around the edges 
The big question is going to be a pharmaceutical costs. But I, I suspect you'll see a battle in the Congress. There'll be an effort to acquire the pharmaceuticals to negotiate price with, with Medicare. Medicare is the biggest provider in the United States, and we don't negotiate prices with the United States. Medicare does not negotiate our prices with the pharmaceutical companies. In every other country, the, the government does negotiate uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug prices. Uh, we don't. And um, if we were to negotiate uh, prices, it's my judgment that um, the prices that Americans pay for, pharma for drugs would be lowered um, and that would lower health care. That's going to be a big battle. So, so Mr. Barkers, um, we have seen technologies disrupt the financial market, um, disrupt the banking system. Um, I would like to ask you that, what do you see all the technology that potentially can help to disrupt or reshape the um, healthcare industry so that, um, you know, that can be in a, in a way to help reduce the cost, also reduce eventually our tax um, deficit, our budget deficit. Like, what, what is the role of technology in healthcare? Well, I'm a big fan of technology. I think technology drives the world, frankly. I mean, lots of people, new ideas at, in different industries and very disruptive. I think it's great. It, it's a, it, makes, it causes greater efficiencies and it keeps people on their toes. It, it just it just helps it helps um, helps it helps our society. Now that's clearly applicable in in, in financial services. And that is, there's some industries where technology can be a big disruptor more easily than in other areas. Yeah, yeah I'm hard pressed to see where uh, uh, the new technologies can back up. There are certain areas in, in healthcare. Um, where new technologies can be a disruptor and very helpful. One is the use of AI um, as a diagnostic tool um, for, uh, to detect all kinds of diseases. Let's say, you know, cancer, for example. The, the, the greater the, the use of AI, the greater the database, um, the more likely it is that um, a company is going to figure out um, which patients are most likely to get a, a, a cancer as opposed to not, and what forms of cancer they're gonna get and what kinds of therapies are best. It's not just cancer, um, it's, it's, it's virtually all maladies. And you're gonna find new technologies are going to, could also very much uh, uh, determine through the AI, through, the use, through AI, one's DNA and that DNA um, analysis is going to very much help. Um, I, I th that's that that's the area where I see great advances in technologies. Now, we all know what happened to Elizabeth Holmes with, with Theranos when she thought she had an idea. <laughs> that's a new technology that's going to revolutionize healthcare. Of course, it, the fraud didn't work, but that's just one person. To... Sorry. Yeah, but 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 still, there are a lot of I know a lot of people come to me with ideas and want my help to help navigate new technologies. And they're just, they're, 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 my point is it's disruptive and just, and just separate discrete areas of healthcare. And it's, it's been, it's, other, that's where I think the big, 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 uh, big promise is. Thanks, thanks for the insight on the healthcare. Um, a lot of us, of course, are here because they want to hear about US-China relationships. So I yeah. do want to switch to that topic sure. um, while we have time. Um, so US re-engaged China um, about 40 years ago in China, um, joined WTO. Thank you so much for your um, facilitation. Um, so it, in the last 40 years, China's GDP, um, you know, as a percent of the world, grew from 2% to um, 20, 22%. Um, and so that essentially creates a new emerging power in, in the world stage. So I'd like to, um, you know, as, as someone that has um, a tremendous amount of experience in international trade, and in the foreign, car, foreign policy, what is the um, overall overarching view, I guess, going forward um, in terms of the US-China relationship? Is it going to be collaborative, competitive, or is it something that's you know, fundamentally that's going to reshape um, the two countries? Um, can you give us a view? And we can also talk about uh, the trade war um, after that. Sure. I, I think the... Um, the relationship basically is 
is going to be a, a tenuous. It's going to be kind of rough sailing. But bottom line, I think it's going to be, by and large, okay. Um, I say that because we're as the two largest economies in the world, we, we both know it's much, far better that we try to get along with each other than not. We're economically joined together at the hip. I mean, U.S. China trade investment is, is so important. U.S. And Americans, American companies investing in China is very important to those companies. And it's very important to China. I have, I have friends in China, Chinese companies, who say the Chinese government just really is, is helping them get more foreign investment because China wants more foreign investment. So it's, it's, it's really, China's government is aggressively, is, is positively is working trying to get more U.S. investment in China. It's true that there, there's less Chinese investment last year, um, two years in, in the U.S. It's fallen off dramatically. <clears throat> I think under President Biden, you'll see an attitude that we more conducive to more Chinese investment in America. The, uh, the two presidents, President Trump, President Biden, are extremely different in terms of tone, in terms of, of, of approach um, to the relationship. President Trump uses his Twitter account, and he, he probably is, is, his policy changes from day to day. Sometimes he says he loves President Xi Jinping. Sometimes he's, he doesn't. Um, and uh, it's frankly, his advisors are not sure what his policy is because he hasn't really, he doesn't follow his advice as much as most people would. And so it's, you'll find it, President Biden uh, will um, use traditional um, diplomatic channels. He'll work with international organizations. He, uh, his word will be his bond. He'll, he'll again not use a Twitter account. Um, he'll try to negotiate a, a, a solid relationship with with President Xi, um, but he Biden will not um, come across as uh, somebody who's quote soft on China. He just he will not. There are lots of sanctions that have been imposed on China and Chinese people by President Trump, um, and President Biden first of next year, will not rescind those. He will not repeal those. They'll, they'll remain, they'll stay there for the time being. Now, if the relationship tends to work better, then I think he'll revisit some of those sanctions and, and maybe uh, back off. He will not, I doubt strongly that he'll impose new sanctions. I doubt that'll happen. Uh, but he will just try to kind of steady the, the boat a little bit, make sure that this, boat doesn't rock too much at his relationship and, and see where he could go from there. He also will focus first on the U.S. economy rather than on, than on the U.S.-China relationship. He'll focus first on the U.S. economy to, to strengthen U.S., to, to solve as much as he can COVID, put that behind him. I might take a year or two. And then infrastructure, we talked about that, and help make America strong. Um, education, or try to boost education in America. His view is, is several fold. One is to help people who need help in America. I mean, people have a lot of jobs and, and maybe caused by COVID and people need help. Second, it's to um, strengthen America's infrastructure, America's economic position. So we're a stronger company, country and that will hopefully address um, the, de the deficit. And third, strengthen the U.S. economy vis-a-vis -vis China. As I think of President Biden believes, and I agree, I agree with him, that uh, the, the stronger the U.S. economy is, the more it's going to be able to project foreign policy and, and power worldwide. I, I think the Chinese understand strength more than do any other people. And the Chinese can, can, can smell weakness a lot farther away than than most people can. And, um, and uh, Joe Biden, I think, knows that he's got to appear strong with respect to China. He can't appear weak. And the stronger the U.S. economy is, the more he could, is in a better position to negotiate with China. I, I, so far, I think you'll see a, a President Biden in the United States um, 
um, the, the fancy term these days is compete with China. Um, not, and I'm not sure what compete means. Um, I've asked that question of, of uh, people with Biden administration. Now, now, what does compete mean? Does that mean we win or does that mean we collaborate? What does compete mean? And um, I don't get a good answer, frankly. They just, they're not really sure what that, what that means. Um, and I, 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 you will not, though, see a Biden administration um, want to stop China's rise. You will not see that. America is not, is, he's too smart to know you can't stop China's rise. It's impossible to stop China's rise. So why try? And frankly, you should even, it's better that we work together than we, we compete in an adversarial way. So he, he'll try to compete in a, in a friendly way rather than an adversarial way. That's, that I think is gonna be his approach. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, uh, you know, China is becoming much more uh, uh, self-dependent, you know, building, you know, Huawei's trying to build its own semiconductors, for example, not have to rely on buying other countries, uh, companies, semiconductors for their equipment, just as an example. Um, I, I have a highest regard, the highest respect for the ability that Chinese who are so hardworking, so practical, pragmatic, find solutions and get stuff done. Um, and I, I just, I, and I think the Biden administration is going to recognize that. And, um, and so it's, that's why it's not going to try to stop China's rise. And also why um, they'll try to compete. But Joe Biden, I've known Joe Biden 40 years. We were, we were together in the Senate. He came to my wedding as vice president of Montana. We're close personal friends. Joe Biden's natural inclination is, is to collaborate, to work together. He's a decent, very decent man. That's his natural inclination. And I, I think that um, President Xi will notice that. And President Xi, who cares about his people, just like Biden cares about his people, are going to say, OK, Xi, maybe we can work together and find some accommodation here. That, that's my, I think that will happen. That, that, that's really great insight. And at the end of the, um, I think at the end of the, of the day, it's more important to collaborate and build a bigger pie, even though the share may be a little smaller, but we still get a bigger pie. That's um, hopefully, you know, a, a common sense that, that people will share. Um, the, what are the issues, the most critical issues? I mean, we all know that US and China, they're on a different system and there's no way that each side can change the other side on that. Um, so besides that, what are the other most critical issues that the two countries can work together for the benefit of their own country and also for the globe? Well, I, the, the most obvious is, is climate, uh, climate change. <clears throat> when I was uh, serving as U.S. ambassador to China, um, and by the way, I'm, I'm advising the Biden transition team uh, on China, I'm giving them all kinds of advice, what I think the Biden presidency should should do when it gets elected back to China. Whether whether they take the advice, that's another matter. But at least I'm working with them. Um, when I was over in, serving in Beijing, um, it took a while, but it was finally, as you know, we, we got President Obama and President Xi to agree together to attack climate. It's wonderful. There's a, a big press conference, the two of them working together. President Xi representing developing countries, President Obama representing the developed countries, and we're on our way. Both countries in, in, enter the Paris Accord, and we're going to together um, with other countries ad address climate. Unfortunately, Trump's withdrawn from the Paris Accord, and unfortunately, China's um, the amount of carbon that China now produces in the air has, has gone up quite a bit. Twenty-eight percent of all the carbon emitted emissions today are, are, China, are from China. The next highest emitter is US, it's about 13%. The next highest after that, I think, is India and Asia, it's about seven. So even though President Xi has said he wants to be, China wants to be carbon free, I think he said by 2060, um, still there's it, it, a lot more carbon going up in the air with Chinese power plants it's good, and new ones online. So it's gonna be hard for him to reach that objective by, 19, by 2060. However, we should try. No question. And that's one area that we, I think we really could get back on track where we collaborate. Another could be North Korea. North Korea is a thorn in the side of both China and of the United States. Iran is another one. The Iran nuclear accords might be some way to 
work there. And global health gets back to COVID. Now, I, maybe I'm kind of naive, but um, when, co when COVID became an issue uh, in, in, uh, in Hubei province in, in China, I thought, gee, here's a great opportunity. The United States president should say, oh, we're so sorry all, all that's happening over there in, in your country. We want to help. We'll send over scientists. We'll send over healthcare workers. We'll, we'll just, we really want to help stamp out. We want to help you. We want to help you. Show good faith. Uh, again, I might be, a little bit, might be a little naive, and I'm not quite sure if President Xi would accept U.S. Um, offers of aid. I don't know. But at least the United States could have publicly made that offer and showed us good faith. It'd be a, an offer in good faith, not an offer looking for a quid pro quo, just offer just totally in good faith, want to help people. And uh, <clears throat> we, we missed the boat there. But we're still, COVID is a, a worldwide issue. There's still opportunity. And it's an opportunity for President Biden to call President Xi and said, boy, we got a problem here. Boy, we were impressed what you did over in China, how much you clamped down COVID and there's so few new cases in China. You know, United States, as you know, we, today we have 100,000 new cases a day. Um, so that, that's an area where our two countries can cooperate. You know, as you know, a lot of Chinese manufacturers that can quickly turn on the dime to make um, uh, uh, PPE equipment, protective equipment, masks and gowns and so forth and, and send shipping over the United States. Um, so that's, it's, there's gotta be a way there to, for the two countries to work together. I think on trade and on, on, on yeah, you know, I think we should find a way to roll back the tax cuts, the, the tariffs on each other. You know, the Trump tariffs, the initial Trump tariffs were, were, were nonsense. The initial ones were on steel and uh, Chinese steel, Canadian, other countries steel uh, under, the, under the guise of national security. Well, there's no national security concern about steel imports in the United States. And, um, but anyway, we should look to try to figure out a way to roll back those tariffs, both sides. Yeah, thanks. There's quite a long list of um, questions and issues that it seems that both sides can collaborate together, which is great. Um, TC they has 14 global ch chapters in the financial hubs around the world. Um, so I do want to ask a question from one of my concerned Hong Kong friends. Um, his question is, during the Cold War um, and confrontation between the East and West from 1947 to 1991, Hong Kong was almost the only China uh, for China to connect with the West. So in the current shift and changes of the global al uh, alliances in the US trade war backdrop, um, what do you think are the opportunities for Hong Kong? There's two hypothetical outcomes that he won't ask for your opinion. One is, uh, will Hong Kong gradually lose its unique role as bridge between China and the West and becomes another economic zone like Shenzhen and Shanghai, or the US and China um, economic dispute continue and um, Hong Kong can be re-engaged as a bridge between US and China. What is you, uh, your view and which is more likely or another solution? My preference is the latter. I very much hope that Hong Kong could be a bridge and to some degree revert to its earlier status as a bridge <clears throat> to the United States. Um, I, I think it's going to be, one cannot turn the clock back. You can't go backwards. You can only go forwards. So the question is, going forward, what can one do to help preserve the unique status of Hong Kong? Um, I, I was quite disturbed when President Trump revoked the special trade status of Hong Kong. And I was quite concerned when he imposed sanctions on certain Hong Kong people with respect to you know, uh, Hong Kong's reaction or Chinese implementation of his national security law. And so the question is, under a President Biden, will that change? President Biden's inclination would be to want to, to revoke um, that revocation <laughs> that President Trump uh, enacted. However, much of this depends on President Xi. Much of this depends on China. Much of it depends on the degree or how a, um, China slash Hong Kong implement the new National Security Act. Um, if it's implemented lightly, just, just very, very, uh, only where there's, it, 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 Hong Kong authorities find someone who clearly is a terrorist, um, that'll make it easier. On the other hand, if the 
the new National Security Act in Hong Kong is implemented in a more draconian way, then that clearly is going to make it difficult for the United States to, to look kindly um, on Hong Kong. And there'll be, there, there, don't forget, there are many, many people in the United States who are really concerned about the abuse of human rights worldwide. <clears throat> It's um, it's Hong Kong. The perception that human rights are being abused in Hong Kong, I think that's overstated, frankly. But the perception of, of human rights being abused in Xinjiang, um, that's a big hot button issue among human rights activists in the United States. It's kind of an interesting little insight here. That is, President Xi's concerned about Hong Kong. And, uh, I attended, I was at the summit between Obama and Xi in 2000. 14, I guess it was, and at, at Jung Nang Hai. And President Xi kept asking President Obama over and over again, what about Hong Kong? You Americans, you're fomenting unrest down there in Hong Kong. And Obama said, oh, no, no, no we're not. But he kept, because Xi kept asking that question, I, it was clear to me that Hong Kong was very, very important to President Xi. So it's, I, I, you'll see, uh, Xi is not, she will not give up Hong Kong. She, President Xi doesn't care, frankly, if the world criticizes him because of the Chinese government passed the national security law in Hong Kong. But he also is a smart man, President Xi. And he's, he's, I think he'll, he'll exercise that act in Hong Kong lightly, not, not heavily. And that, so, so as to, to minimize a world concern about China in, in Hong Kong, you know, it's, it's like this. This is a lot like the stock market. So much is discounted to the present, you know, even though the handover is is, is two thousand forty-seven. You know, people all know there's going to be a handover. <laughs> so it's 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 it's. If I were in Hong Kong, it's living in Hong Kong. I'd have a. This would be a big question on my mind too. It's a difficult one. Yeah, I agree. Hong Kong is a very resilient city. Um, one other interesting observation that I find out about you is um, you sit on the board of Ingram Micro, um, which is a very large technology company in the US. And uh, you also serve as um, board advisor to Alibaba until May 2019. So that gives you a very unique perspective. And of course, I'm not, you know, um, please don't, I'm not asking for, for you to share any confidential information, but just more like strategically from a high level view, um, you know, what do you see are the key factors that contribute to the innovation and success of those uh, technology companies, both from the US and China? And what type of environment um, do you think that can help Ingram Micro thrive in China and help Alibaba thrive in the US? Well, Ingram Micro is, a, is doing very, very well because it basically it's a wholesale technology company. And during this COVID period, with People are buying a lot more laptops and buying a lot more computers to do a lot more work at home on Zoom or Team Microsoft or what uh, it's all technology companies are doing quite well, partly because of COVID, to, to be true, truthful. Um, it's um it's it's it doesn't matter whether you're an Ingram Micro or where we are. If you're an American company want, trying to operating in China, in my judgment, so much of it depends upon being in China, spending time in China, developing relationships and learning that China is not one country. China is many countries. China is all, is all the provinces, cities and so forth, different party secretaries, different cultures. It's just, there's so many, so much, China is so, such a mosaic. So it's deciding in which parts of China one wants to do business, whether to invest or to sell, and then just work at it and, and, and learn local customs, learn local relationships. And you know, Starbucks does very well in China. Uh, KFC does well in China. There are a lot of uh, American companies that, that do do quite well in China. I remember talking to a very large, well, it was, I'll tell you, it was a Honeywell. The CEO said, you, are you worried about the trade secrets being stolen in, the, in China? Oh, no, no, we do really well in China. We're, we do well in China. China likes us. It's, it's, uh, we, we do well. So a lot of it is relationships and attitude 
and, and working to try to, to develop those relationships and those contacts. It's very important. And being candid, I, I, I believe very strongly <clears throat> that the Chinese respect candor uh, more than do Americans. When you're talking to the Chinese, just be honest and don't, don't be, ask, ask, ask questions, ask constructive questions, not, not you know, uh, obsequious, don't talk down, but just person to person, constructive question. How do we do this? How, how do we do that? And um, you know, I, I think that, that, that works pretty well in China and not, and not be too worried about the political headline news, <clears throat> um, it's, which I think too many people get too worked up about, but rather just nuts and bolts trying to get, talk to somebody who knows how to get the job done. And the same thing in the US. Um, however, if you're a Chinese high technology company, it's hard to do business in the US. We have this outfit called Zifius that looks at the national security aspects of any Chinese investment. And um, it's Zifius is getting tighter and tighter with each passing month. So my advice is stay away from high technology um, um, investments unless you can partner with the US company and get around the CFIUS problem. But if you're a low tech company, oh my gosh, there's so much one can do. I remember I was so impressed with, um, is it Wang Shi? What's the, the big pork producer in China that bought Smithfield hams um, in the United States? They did it really well. How they do it? They came over. I remember I talked to the top guy. I, I loved him. He's like, I think it was Wang Shi, Wang Shi, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, they came to the United States early. They talked to lots of Iowa hog producers and say, hey, you know, gee, this is what we're thinking of. What do you think? They talked to corn producers. This is kind of what we're thinking. What do you think? And, and it made, them, made the Iowa corn producers and the Iowa hog producers realize that the, the, this, new, this Chinese company is not going to take their jobs away. In fact, it's a good deal, but it's a direct pipeline. They can now directly sell their hogs through Smithfield uh, and, and, and corn to China. So, but they did it correctly. By correctly, I mean they did. They came over, asked questions, developed those relationships to show that hey, that there's a way they can work things out and for the mutual benefit of both. That, that that's really great um, insight. Um, so even though it appears that I'm not asking a lot of time for Q and A, but I am because I'm monitoring <laughs> the questions online, and I think a lot of them you have addressed earlier. Um, so let me ask you one other question. Um, you know, as um, especially during the pandemic, um, technology company uh, has been one of the driving force behind the recovery or, or during this, um, you know, lockdown period or semi-lockdown period. On the other hand, um, small and medium business um, in general, generally speaking, they created about 80% of the jobs. So um, I'd like to you that um, what, what are some of the good policies in U.S. towards the large cap and the small medium companies that you think is a good policy for China to share? And what do you see from China's policy side regarding high tech and uh, small business that potentially can be something helpful for the U.S. in our policy here? Okay, I'm sorry, Maggie, the, the last question, could you ask the last question again, please? Yes, the last, so the, the last, last question. The la last part, the last part of you. Okay, so what do you think is the China policy regarding high tech and small business that can also be helpful for the U.S. decision making in terms of policy here? Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions. It's true, <clears throat> medium-sized um, companies create 80% of the jobs. That's true in America. I dare say it's somewhat true in China as well. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, it takes effort on the part of the companies themselves and the U.S. and the government. The nice government has to work to make sure that medium-sized companies um, uh, are included in, in policies that, are, that the, the country is implementing. For example, let's take drugs. The um, United States is trying to develop all, many companies, countries, a drug to, com uh, to, to, to combat COVID, to develop a vaccine that prevents COVID. But the United States government has given lots of money only to the large companies. They don't give to develop the vaccine, not to the smaller pharmaceutical companies, only the large. And that's a natural inclination by governments to give money to the big companies because they're the big companies are, are known by the governments. The small companies are not known by the governments. So it takes a lot of work on the part of 
affirmative work on the part of the government to make sure force money out into smaller companies that otherwise would go to bigger. And, small, and smaller companies have to just lobby too. So in China, I, I, my, I have a good number of Chinese friends in the private sector complain, frankly, to me that um, the SOEs are getting favored too much in China. The private sector is getting left out. Uh, now I see President Xi talking about, China talking about relaxing loans restrictions with respect to its small companies. And I, I hope that's working. When I ask my Chinese friends, is that working? And I get kind of mixed responses. But it's, it's, it, takes a, it takes an effort because the more small companies are involved, the more there's going to be more innovation, there's going to be more disruption. Because by definition, the smaller companies are going to be disruptive against the bigger ones. And that's why they're there to disrupt the bigger ones. And so it, it should, it should, I just take my, we should bend over backwards to help smaller companies, especially um, disrupting smaller companies, because I think that, that very much helps people. I, 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 can't give, I can't give you good advice. I, don't, I do not know what, what, what China can do to help small business, but, but it very much should. Great, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> for the interest of the time, I'll just ask um, our closing career uh, question. Um, <clears throat> So um, Andrew Young's running for, uh, you know, he ru his run for, for the U.S. presidency um, has inspired many Asian Americans and Chinese Americans. Uh, what are your advice for, um, you know, young Asian Americans pursuing political career? And this will be our last question before our time's up, unfortunately. Well, I, yeah, I was struck with the Jack Ma's advice when asked that question uh, at, a, at a forum, maybe a couple, three years ago. And he said, um, as I can recall, um, sign up with, if you're young, um, getting out of college or whatnot, or sign up with a smaller sort of medium-sized company, not too small, and, but, and, but not too big. Because you want to, with a company that's it's nimble, it's, it's, it's moving, things are happening, a lot of talent. Um, and, and stay there for about, oh, four or five years, six years, where you, you will have learned a lot. And then set out and set up your own company. You just, you just, you just do it better. But go to a, a mid-sized, smaller to mid-sized company that's really good and spend some time there, work hard and learn. And after four or five years, you, you will learned a lot and then set out on your own. That's, that's good advice. Um, there's, there's basically um, pros and cons. You can learn quite a lot from a small, smaller shop and you need yeah. the um, you know, bigger ones to give you the price on. Right. Um, great. So this is the, um, I guess we, we are at the end of our conversation and thank you so much for your insights. Really, really grateful, especially your views in terms of U.S.-China relationship, the U.S. tax policies and um, healthcare reform. Uh, thank you so much for your time with us today. Um, audience, let's um, you know, raise our hands uh, to thank Ambassador um, Falkert. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I believe very strongly in the U.S.-China relationship and I'm spending much of my time, half my time, trying to help make sure this relationship works. It's so important. Yeah, thank you, Senator Marcus. It's yeah. a very insightful discussion, and I think answer a lot of questions of the audience. And thanks, Maggie, for a great interview.